Yo, 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 we back with another 30 Jobs Later. I'm your host, Corey Rodriguez, and I'm Orlando Baxter. Actually, Orlando's not here again, because you know how Orlando does. He's always out and about somewhere else, so we don't know where the hell Orlando is right now. He's probably somewhere in the world chilling out. But I am sitting here with my very good friend and guest on the podcast today, Mr. Clinton Graham. What's up, Clinton? How you doing, C? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, Clinton... Uh, Clinton Graham is somebody that I went to element, well, middle school with, and then we went to high school together, we wrestled together, um, this dude's a beast, beast of a wrestler, Clinton went on to play football overseas, we're gonna get into all of that in just a couple minutes here, but just wanted to do a quick intro, we're glad to have him on here, we're gonna talk about his uh, new product that he just brought to the line called King Poppy. We're going to get to that. That's in the in the early stages of formation. And uh, I'm excited to, to dig in and talk more about that. So, with no further ado, give it up for Clinton Graham. Oh, we're going crazy. We're going crazy. Okay, good. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Corey. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, we grew up in Milton. And the funny thing is, like, people always ask you, like, even when I travel, you, you guys know I go everywhere. I go all over this beautiful country, and I'll be in different places. And people often be like, oh, there's black people in in Boston? There's black people in Massachusetts? And I'm always like, yeah, we're here. There's some of us here. But I will be honest with you, there's less of us in Milton, which is where we grew up. <laughs> there's a lot. It, it would be more, it would be more, uh, it would make more sense for people to be like, there's black people in Milton? Right. Than for them to be like, there's black people in Massachusetts or in Boston. Um... What was that like, man? Just like, what was your experience? I've talked about my experience sometimes growing up in Milton and seeing what it's like, but Clinton's Jamaican. And um, what was that experience like? You know what I'm saying? Was it a, did you feel comfortable all the time? Do, would you at times feel like things you did, things you did stood out more, things you did were worse, things you did were better? Like, what was that like? Just, just, being in Milton, honestly? It's a great question. It's a great question. Uh, let, let me see. Um, now, when you talk about things that I did, did it stand out more? First, was I uncomfortable? Yes. When you're, you know, not around people that look like you, you're going to be a little bit uncomfortable. You, you don't know. But I'm the type of person that if I'm uncomfortable, I try to reach across and gain the comfort. I try to learn from the other side. So they can learn about me as well. Mm -hmm. um, what age did you actually move to Milton? I want to say second grade. Okay. 87. Because I met you in middle school. Right. So I was in second grade. Okay. At Tucker. At Tucker Elementary. Yep. Um, Tucker so Elementary is a middle school on the other. There's two sides of Milton. We call it east I, side and elementary. west side. Elementary. Right. Tucker is an elementary school on the west side of Milton. I grew up on the east side of Milton. So... Then once we all get to like middle school, which is six, seven, because I know some towns is different uh, the way they break the grades now. But Milton, we did one through five is elementary, six through eight is middle, and then nine through 12 is high school. I know some some high schools have like seven through they 12. They start, yeah, they start like seven, eight, nine through, yeah. You know, I'm always like, that's weird. How do you, how do you even do that? I'm like, yeah. how do you not have six, seven, eight? You yeah. got to do it the right way. I don't call it weird. I call it they're trying to build a, you know, a, a Team, you know that football yeah. team. Oh, the football you know, team, yeah. That, that. <laughs> yeah, because I, I, they they start from early. You know, they start their their programs, their wrestling programs, their football programs. So they already know what the coach expects, how right. the team, the cohesion, how people work with each other, and, and that's football yeah. and wrestling. But yeah. they'll do things like that. Right. I, I'll say this. So my side of town was East Side. So I grew up in East Milton, and so it was probably so. If we look at the ra the 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 racial breakdown of where I grew up. I would say in East Milton, it was easily two of us uh, that were black <laughs> on that side of town. Yeah. And then you go to the other side of town where Clinton grew up and you have many, many more. I can't yeah. even count how many more, but it was just much it was bit, more. It was a bit more diverse. It was yeah. a bit more diverse, yeah. but we say that diverse for Milton. Wait a second. You know what I'm saying? We're wait, talking. Wait, we're wait, only wait. talking like 30. <laughs> let me re let me rephrase. <laughs> <laughs> it was a bit more diverse than the East Side. Yeah, then the East Side exactly of Milton. exactly of Milton. Yes, right, right. because you when when you really look at the numbers, so someone will be like, "Oh, what do you mean? Is that really a big deal?" But we're looking at numbers where we're talking about 
I don't know, uh, maybe 30 black people on that side of town that you're in school with at any given time, sure. uh, 30 to a ratio of maybe, I don't know, 200 or uh, maybe more than that, maybe 300 or right. 100 right. people yeah. that you're I mean, in school was, with. It, listen, it, it was enough that you knew everyone's name. It was enough that yeah. two lunch tables could pretty much hold all the black people that would be surrounding you. There would be, there yeah. may be one or two more peppered into the right. lunchroom. Right. But really, mm-hmm. in the cafeteria during lunch, there would be two tables of black people and that would be, uh, and then everything else right. was white and there would be maybe three Asian people. Right. You know, and that was it. Fair to say? Is that it, accurate? I mean, that's pretty accurate. That's pretty accurate. Yeah. What I grew up with, especially on the west side, we were, again, more diverse than the east side of Milton. Right. Um, which is just saying what Milton is, you know. Um, but it has picked up in, in the recent years, of course. But back in those days, it was just a, I don't know, it was a learning experience. You know, yeah. you, you sort of, you have the antlers up a little bit and you're looking around. You know, I remember uh, moving into the, Moving into the uh, to the house there, and my cop was a I mean my neighbor was a police officer, mm-hmm. and then next door was an older gentleman, Mister Kirschenbaum, mm-hmm. and he was from Germany. Mm-hmm. You know him and his wife, um, and those are my neighbors. You know, so when I'm coming out playing whatever basketball or I'm I'm riding the bicycles and I'm looking around like okay who who could I play with? You know I see these, these old people, you know and. And instead of just um, looking at me as, oh, what's this little kid? What is he doing? They were actually welcoming, you mm-hmm. know? And I'm still friends with that police officer to this day. Yeah. You know? And, and that's, that's, that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of beauty that community, communities can have. And, um, <laughs> Which I, I like that you touch on that. And right. let me just, see, that's, that's cool. I wasn't even thinking about going in that direction, but I love that you just touched on that. And here's, here's why. Let, let me say this. So, because some people don't know this. From, so, when I say I grew up on the east side of town, it was predominantly white. Don't get it twisted in the sense where, like, my I wasn't like I got, you know, there's some black people who grew up in a white, predominantly white area. And, and you would consider these people to be whitewashed. I won't say that I... My bad, we had a small technical difficulty there real quick. But what I was going to say is, I won't say that I've been... Uh, whitewash per se but i will say that i grew up in uh in an environment with a lot of with a lot of white people and a lot of white influence but also my family as you guys know own a lot of barber shops all over boston my roots of my family are definitely not in milton and so that i'm always out with with black people it wasn't like i was just like some kid that was cast away into this world of living with white people and it's like oh all my thoughts and all of my ways are come from that way but I can't say that I wasn't somehow influenced by that way of thinking as well which I was which I which I gather as a positive and I say I gather that as a positive is because I like being able to look at things both ways I like being able to look at something when I see somebody who's black and they're acting over the top and ridiculous and and, and crazy. I like to be able to identify that, like knowing that that's, I I like to be able to identify that knowing the sentiment that somebody white is thinking. So I know like, this is what they're thinking about you right now. But I also love the fact that I'm black, man. So I know how I feel and I know how my people feel when somebody white is doing that too. And it, and I and I love being able to address that. So then, when you have both sides of that, right. and this is what I say, growing up in Milton, I want to see if you agree with this. Mm-hmm. Growing up in Milton gives you the ability to be able to identify both sides, and to be able to bring both sides together. There's nothing more powerful than being able to bring people together based on understanding what both sides are thinking, not just how you're personally feeling. You know what I mean? Not just like, oh, I'm black, so I'm supposed to be mad at somebody white for this. Right. Or somebody white is acting like that because of this. But when you're socialized around white people and you're socialized around black people, then when you're socialized around both, what you find is that there are so many miscommunications that happen that you're able to identify 
that other black people that haven't been socialized and other white people that haven't been socialized around each other can't identify. I have family members that are really quick to get angry at somebody white for something that I may look at and be like, oh, they didn't, they didn't mean it like that. I, I, I know them. And I hate to be like, I know them like I know all, but I know culturally I've been, I, I, I know that that wasn't what was meant by that. And, and but on that same, t- on yeah. that same, on the same, uh, does that make sense what I'm saying? I understand exactly. That's why I saying. love growing That's, up in Milton. And what you said definitely resonates with me Yeah. because I feel I can talk to people from different backgrounds, different yeah. upbringing, different classes and find commonality, mm-hmm. you know, the building of, um, you know, are, are the expression of opinions, but the building of commonalities while both respecting each other's differences mm-hmm. is the definition of diversity. Right. Okay, so that's one thing I, I like to um, always make sure I know that definition and, and make sure that we're trying to do, or I try to do. And when you said that um, earlier, you were saying that you know you understood one side of the, uh, of the coin and the other side at the same time, so therefore you can bring those both, you know, you can bridge the gap. That's good. I mean, that's, that's something that's much needed and we don't do today. Um, I always found it in- interesting that people that got mad, you know, about s- something, they don't really understand what it is to be the other person, mm-hmm. you know, on what side, wh- wh- whoever we are, whether we're black or whether we're white, mm-hmm. you know, they don't, we, we don't empathize and, and to truly, you know, have empathy, you really got to put yourself in that person's shoes, you know, right. You know, and I, I often say, you know, growing up in Milton, you know, when I'm trying to go and get Laffy Taffy's at uh, Tedeschi or... Um, Tedeschi's is a store that we have in Milton. Tedeschi's is a just a store like a like a 7-Eleven or a Cumberland right. Farms, right. depending on where you live. The local food mart. That's yeah. A, you know, local convenience store. And I'm a, I'm a kid and I'm, I'm going down the street and I'm having fun and then you see older people walk on the other side of the street when you're coming down yep. or when you're on an elevator clench, and then they clench the purse. Right. You don't understand what that does to a young person of color. Right. Okay, so that automatically gives you the radar to start, that now, now you're starting to see like, oh, well, from five years old to six years old to seven years old to 15 to 21 to 22 to 38. You're starting to see you have the radar already. So when something is said on TV or something is said out in public, you already know, you know, you're already thinking. Maybe you don't already know because you don't know someone's intention. That's speculation. You're going to speculate what mm-hmm. someone means. But you're already thinking on both sides. Like, well, what do they mean by that? Right. And it can be frustrating. And not frustrating, but also stressful. Because sometimes we just want to just relax and be like, oh, okay. Yeah, but we, but we are given the blessing and the curse. Right. Of being of growing up when you grow up when you're very strongly rooted in yourself and in your family and in your and in your culture mm-hmm. being whatever that is and then you grow up also inside of another culture right it's it's one of the most awesome things in the world I think those type of people will make the best police officers if we look at it. In the mass of things, if we look at it in the totality of things, I'm not saying there can't be somebody who comes from a predominantly black or predominantly white neighborhood that can't interact with other people of other races. You know, I'm talking about someone who just goes to a predominantly white college, predominantly white neighborhood they grew up in, and then they go and they and they're working and they're dealing with all races of people. I can't say that that person will never will will always be a a problem when they're dealing with people that don't look like them. But what I'm trying to say is that if you grow up with if you grow up and you're socialized around all people, everybody starts to look like a person and less of a threat. And you are able to identify what a threat is and you're able to also identify what just a regular person is that may be an asshole, right? Different situations. Because to make it more clear, I don't want to keep talking in like generalizations. Mm-hmm. What I mean is like if you grow up around, let's say you're white and you grow up around black people. You grow up around just enough black people to understand black people. If a situation happens and you're a police officer and you're able to look into that person's eyes and know like, oh, this person's scared or this person did something wrong mm-hmm. or this person is a, a regular person that is in a situation. If you're not 
used to dealing with black people Mm -hmm. and you see somebody, you might look at that person and misinterpret everything about them immediately and think that like this person's angry, this person's a threat, this person's about to try to kill me. So you may irrationally react differently, Mm -hmm. right? And it goes both ways. I'm not saying that that's not the same for somebody black that grows up around white people who feels like somebody black would feel like, oh, this fucking white person is just disrespecting me because I'm black. Right. But are they really disrespecting you because they're black or are they really saying what it is? Is that person, you have to be able to identify, is this person just a dickhead, right? right. Is this person just a dickhead or, or, are, they, or are they being racist? Because you, what you'll find is that we hit these sensitive hot buttons on each other. And if you're not socialized with each other, you won't realize that. And it's very difficult. Like, and, and I'll, say, I'll say this, um, you know... If you're, if you're, let's, again, I'm going to go back. If you're a white officer and you're not used to dealing with black people, right? You, you've never really been socialized around black people. You don't have any black friends. This is just not what you know. You don't give a fuck. You, you, you don't, you don't know what it is because you just TV is all you know well, black see, people. That's, that's the problem. Right? So, so, yeah. so let me make this mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. If that's how you feel, then every, then you're going to misconstrue the way that this person deals with you. Right. You're going to misconstrue the way that this black person responds to you. The same way that, like, I'm pretty sure that you're not very well versed, very, very well versed in dealing with bears, right? Are you? Are you? Have you dealt with bears very often? Let me think. Let me think. Gummy, gummy bears. <laughs> yeah, gummy, gummy, okay, gummy, gummy bears. bears. Okay, yeah. you're a That's it. Oh, right? Is that it's yeah. 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 That's All right. it. So, that, no. so, so, if you're not used to dealing with bears, right. and a bear turns around and look, and I'm not saying black people are bears. I'm just making the point of like familiarity. Okay. Right. If, if, if a bear is looking at you a certain way, if you're not used to dealing with them, you're like, yo, yes. I have to kill this bear because this bear is, is this bear about to fuck me up like something's going wrong, right? Or I, I need to do something different. I'm afraid right now. But if you're used to dealing with bears, the calmness, the, 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 the leeway that this particular bear would get in order to deal with you before something fatal or before something violent was to happen is unbelievable. But it's unbelievable. Talking, but there's two things. One thing, if you're not familiar with something, you know, and, and, and therefore you're going to have a uh, preconceived notion or, or an assumption about it, based on your education, then challenge your education. You know, education to me is challenging education. Don't just have people just tell you what, what people are like mm-hmm. or what things are supposed to be, challenge it. Ask why. Or go and experience it for yourself. Now, when you're talking about the bear, okay, the bear, there's environmental police that Mm -hmm. actually have more uh, experiences with bears. So they're not going to handle a bear as they would handle a bobcat. Exactly. You see what I mean? So that's the thing. You have to know, okay, let's bring it back to football. How about that? Yeah. Okay. So, linemen. All right? Linemen are big big boys, they, some have some bite and, you know, nastiness to them, which is good, this is football, or some also has, uh, they're maybe more sensitive and you can't yell at them, Mm -hmm. but as a good coach, you're going to yell at the ones you can yell at, you know, running backs, you know, wide receivers, some wide receivers, not also, even some running backs, but there are some positions, uh, some players that you just can't yell at like you can do for other players because that person or that player that you yelled at would fold up in their shell and they wouldn't be able to come out. Okay. The other one that you yell at, you'd be able to get out everything that you can get out. So you can But still- you can diagnose that exactly. as a coach because you're used to dealing with players. But if you're you dealing with players, but you're dealing with players with different psyches or different mentalities. True. So this let's call it let's call it um Different, uh, different people with different perceptions. Don't call it mentality, but call it perceptions um, from how they were brought up. So let's not make it confusing though, right? Because yes. I want to stay clear. Yes. So so from what I'm understanding you to say, let's bring it back to black and white. Let's talk real shit here. Right. If you're a coach and you're dealing with players, right. you're able to identify by knowing the players or because you've dealt with players enough if you've been coaching long enough players enough yeah, you've dealt like with that. players right. enough mm-hmm. to know like 
this is the type of person that I can do this to. This person looking at me this way means this. Right. This person's reactions to the way that I'm treating them is like this. Right. Not necessarily like this person's disrespecting me. This person doesn't want to be on the team. This person, like you're, you're interpreting everything a little bit different because you've dealt with those players all, all across the board. You've dealt with types of players and you understand player types, right? Right. right. So that's my point. Like, if that's the case, as a coach is doing that, he's comfortable dealing with players. Now, you bring a coach in, you bring some new coach in right. who hasn't coached yet, right. and he comes in and he's dealing with the team. He's yelling at the wrong people. Wrong people. And he's right? babying the other wrong people. He's yeah. babying the wrong people, right. yelling at the wrong people. Right. You know what I mean? Misinterpreting what everybody's meaning because he has no experience in doing that. Right. He hasn't been socialized around players yet. He just right. wanted to be a coach. Right. Right? So that's where sometimes I think some of these police officers get into trouble is because they haven't been socialized around the people that they're policing. And if you haven't been, then you miss you misunderstand what is happening with certain people. And I'm not saying it's mm-hmm. all the time, but what I am saying is I'm bringing this all the way back to the police officer that you grew up next to. Right. To the police officers that I know in Milton. To my right. family member that are police officers. I was a criminal justice major and wanted to be an officer myself. Right. To, I bring it back to all of that. To like people who actually give a fuck. People who actually take the time. You get to learn to know officers. I don't hate every police officer. I don't give a fuck. When I hear people say that, and I know that systematically we have a problem as black people mm-hmm. with police as a whole race of people and the police dealing with us on many mass occasions. But I will say this, I've had many, 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 I can't, I can't, for the sake of just being like agreeing with everybody black or, or people black that have a problem with police, I can't then just say like, I've never had positive uh, uh, um, encounters with police. I've had I've had, personally, I've had way more positive encounters than I've had negative. Right, right. It doesn't mean that there hasn't ever been anything negative. And, and the, it doesn't mean that nothing negative happens. Right. But it also means we have to highlight there are some positive ones and that that's what I wanted to do. And I have family that does that. Like, I, I don't condone anybody mistreating anybody. And I don't condone anybody fucking killing us. And I don't condone anybody killing anybody. But I definitely don't condone them at a disproportionate rate killing black people fuck out of here like i'm not i'm not siding with that so i don't want anybody listening to this and be like oh man this dude just he just whatever the police do is cool i'm the fuck i'm not with that but what i am with is that fairly i have to say that i haven't had so many negative encounters i hope i don't go out and get killed by some fucking cop on the way home i haven't had <laughs> as many negative encounters as some people that i know have have. So therefore, but, but we must empathize with those who uh, have. Of course. You know, and it's people who have grown up in different times as well, had different experiences. That's right. You know, my older siblings had different experiences than myself, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, as far as the experiences with police, you sort of, you know, you sort of have to, you got to take it with, with with each situation, you know, each situation is different. So, um, first off, we have to understand, we have to do the right thing. You know, people have to do the right thing, and police officers have to do the right thing. Right. Okay? Can um, we say this, just so you guys know, mm-hmm. Clinton's perspective is also coming, filtered through the fact that he was a correctional officer. So, Clinton was a correctional officer uh, after he went and played football overseas. Uh, semi pro. No, it's professional. Was professional. Yes. Professional overseas football player. Mm-hmm. Then um, he came back over to the States and he was a correctional officer. Yes. And so this is his point of view. You have to understand it's filtered through that. So I want to make sure that that's out there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so it's, uh, so it's much, uh, much more fun in Europe. But um, <laughs> <laughs> coming back to, uh, to being a correctional officer was a little, uh, what's that uh, tone there? Press is right. <laughs> doom, 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 doom. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it was. So, <laughs> yeah. Doom, 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 doom. yeah that, that was pretty yeah. much it. That was every time I clocked in. <laughs> doom, 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 doom. <laughs> <laughs> yep, two and a half years. Anyway, oh, that's funny. Back to you, Jim. So, uh, <laughs> so you know. My experiences there, it was it was more of 
I told the inmates, you know, first of all, these inmates, they're, that's the name, they're called inmates, um, but they were regular people. Some were, yes, we had the bad ones there that you see that did the bad things on the, on the news. Uh, whatever you can think about, yes, we had them. But we also had people that took the wrong turn and did the wrong thing, had one drink too many, and ended up there as well. So I always told um, these people, I said, listen, I'm going to judge you based on how you are with me. My name is not on the side of the building. I'm just enforcing these rules, okay? If you want to play, you know, play, yeah, if you can play checkers, you have TV, they have TVs they can watch in the, in the, in the rec deck or whatever. Um, and they can play the games and, and make their food and all the stuff and have the basketball courts, all the stuff they have, you know, which is, which is good. You know, we need this. But if we go with the, the other route where it's, you know, mean and disrespectful, I can't have that. So I'm going to have to, you know, be a correctional officer at that point and um, make sure order is, you know, uh, restored. But anyway, so my, my point is that we never really tried to, uh, well, I know for, for certain... I took this uh, opportunity to um, bring some type of, um, I don't know, not discipline, but it was just, you know, we were giving them a, a, I was trying to give a structure because my whole thing was if you aren't uh, used to hearing no and then you come in here and then you think you're going to say yes to everything as well and then you're going to go back outside and then come back in again. You know, you're, gonna, you're just going to repeat the process and mm -hmm. come back, you know, not make anything of yourself. So, and plus it also makes me not be getting in trouble for mm -hmm. things that you're supposed to be doing, you know, mm -hmm. for my superiors. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's one thing. No, no, now back to your point with, uh, with officers and, and, and not, not having experiences. I didn't have experiences with, I, I guess I did, but... I didn't have experiences with some of these people, you know, from different areas, from different countries, from different backgrounds, different social upbringings, you know. So, I, but I was still able to, you know, recognize what their issue was or, you know, what their personality trait was. Or, or if I wasn't going to recognize, recognize that right, you know, from the, from the get-go, I still keep that, you know, that... Professional distance, you know. I'm not. We're not gonna. I'm not gonna come overly and, and just try to um, reprimand or um, I don't know. Reprimand or um, just be too too boisterous and too aggressive. Well, like dominate situations too much. Yes, um, and, and, and you know. You, Depends who you ask, you know, they would they probably would say otherwise, you know. Right. But I tried to be by the book, and we were in a prison. We were in a jail. So. But, but let me say this, though. Don't you feel like you... Well, let me ask you. Let me not, let me not tell you this. Let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you feel like you had more of an of a open mind dealing with everybody you were dealing with based on where you grew up? You grew I did, up. I did have an open mind. Definitely. You yeah, have, but but you helped. also grew you grew up you grew up as a black man. Yes. A black boy, black man, turned into a black man growing up in a in, in a in a in a area that was predominantly white. Right. We had a few other races speckled in, but we're really black and white here. Okay. Right. And you being a minority, right? Me being a minority in these situations and you learn how to deal and vibe and ride and that's you learning how to ride and with the police, you learn how to ride with the teachers, you learn how to ride and vibe with the coaches, you learn how to ride and vibe with the with the students and your friends and everybody. All right, because be most people don't look like you where we grew up. Right. But also with with the with the teachers and the coaches, I didn't learn that until I was senior year in high school. Okay, okay. so no credit goes there <laughs> because I didn't play the game until that you know I was like oh, I have to go to college. All right, let me let me let me sh you know, shape up a little bit. Um, and also with the you know with the officers, it, it was it was pretty it was we, we were lucky to have you know the the upbringing because other people don't get that type of experience that we that we received. Well, we know? received some community policing. It yeah. was almost like right. we didn't get. It was rare. Look, it was rare that the officers the, where we grew up in Milton would be like would miss would blatantly mistreat us 
to the point where they were like, hey, man, you're you're one of us. This is a small town. Right. And so that that uh, interaction was crazy because how, it makes you feel so different. And how great would it be if people actually started to you know learn about their neighbors? Jesus, I about mean, their, that's what I'm saying. Learn about their police officers, learn about their firefighters. A couple officers them. lived yeah. in my neighborhood. Right. I'm cool with them. I mean, this is, these are... They, yo, at the end of the day, I do so many police benefits. I do so many police fundraisers. I mean, right. Police officers are people. Right. At the end of the day, you get some assholey things of everything. Here, here's... here's and, and, and let me just make this one point. And I'm going to go back to what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. People get fucked up because... Here's something that messes things up mm -hmm. for police officers. And this is what I, I, I feel... I don't know. I don't want to say I feel bad because this is it is what it is and cameras are going to change a lot of this. But look, everybody calls the police the biggest gang in the world. And it is. They stick together more than anybody else, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have to watch each other's back. It's life or death and they have to look out for each other and that's what they do, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the problem arises when it's like, here's the, the counter argument that people can make to you when you're like, not everybody, not every police officer is bad. Mm -hmm. Some police officers are good. Mm -hmm. There's many, there's more good police officers than bad police officers. Mm -hmm. Here's where someone can really cut that argument up is they'd be like, yeah, there's more good police officers, but when the bad ones do shit, the good ones don't always come to the forefront and report the bad ones, which means that that in turn right. makes them bad ones. So then do we have more bad ones or do we have more good ones? And that's where shit gets foggy because it's like, yeah, man, these officers have to be on the street the next day and they have to be out there with the same people that they see, saw do something fucked up. They need to live their lives. They have families. They want to do what it is that they got to do, right? So now what do they do? Well, this is why I love the introduction of cameras. In my own personal opinion, right. all, like yeah. there's plenty of times when a police officer doesn't agree with what another officer is doing. Right. And instead of going and people be like, they should have did the right thing. But they're like risking their lives as soon as they do that. Because right. they'll be in distress and they need to call and motherfuckers show up slow for them. Right. So what, what now with cameras, I love it. Because now I feel like there's times when shit's going on and someone has a body cam on. And I just feel like all an officer has to do now, he doesn't have to rat. He doesn't have to tell on his, his fellow right. officer. He just has to step out the way. Somebody's filming or his camera's filming. He just has to step out the way. Yeah. It's like, hey, man, you should have did that shit. You told on yourself. We got it on film. Right. You told on yourself. Like, don't, don't now bring me in and say, I'm a rat. We all caught it on film. You did it. That's what happened. Right. And like, I, I, that's why I'm so happy about the emergence of cameras. The downside of it is like, you know... I feel like people will be able to get away with less. You know, they'll be less like giving you breaks. You know, if there, someone's wearing a body cam and you're speeding or you've been drinking and you're a block from your house and you're fucking kind of drunk, you know, where the officer may in the past have been like, follow me, you dummy. You know what I mean? Right, you get right, to go right, home. Right. You may be like, step out the car. Let's go through the sobriety things, you know, and then, you know, you're fucked. You know, everything is just liability. Every, you know, we are in this society where we're so happy and everyone wants to... You know, you know. Unfortunately, make a dollar off off of suing. You know, and and people are really every every industry is all about liability, liability, liability. Um, one thing with the body cams, I am definitely a big proponent on the body cams. I actually, <laughs> that's another that's another story. But Not we'll tell I, the story. <laughs> we that's why we're here. I wanted I, I I would love to have body cams when I was a correctional officer. Yeah. Because. I don't know if you know about a correctional officer audience, but you know there's a lot of things that um, they uh, correctional officers go through. You know, as far as so, what's a typical day? Tell us, like, what do you mean? Like, wh and when you say there's a lot that you go through, like what? All right. Well, okay. Well, I'm talking about you know, I have word of mouth, but people like an inmate will say something that oh, Officer Graham did this, or he said this, or he was me. You know, they have this thing called grievances. Yeah. They can write on officers, okay. inmates, and they can, you know, pass it in and show it to the superiors, and then the superiors would come. And I, to be honest, when I first saw the grievance, like when I first got my first grievance, I think I have the record since I've been there, right? Because again, I'm going to toe the line because I want to sleep well at night, and I'm not going to do anything that's contrary to what's policy, okay? Yeah. 
So what would the grievance be like? Give us wow. the grievance that was on you. Oh, the first grievance, the first grievance, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> so this is something I'm that the, an inmate wrote against you. Yeah, I never forget. Right. The first grievance was, in, uh, Officer Graham said that I was not allowed to watch MTV. I told him to, he, he told me to turn off the TV. And I said that another officer said I could watch it. So he sort of told himself. Mm -hmm. basically you're disobeying an order right that's what it is in there like I said turn that off and the reason is because first of all they're not allowed to watch certain channels because it causes problems if you're watching MTV um, you have rap you have rock and roll you have whatever people fight over channels so there's a reason why they don't well, have the rules and, and to be even more clear I don't really care about the reason because I didn't make the rules right but if a superior comes in and they see that they're watching MTV Guess who they're going to talk to? Right. Not the inmate. Officer Graham. Right. So he actually wrote the grievance. And I looked at the night, and I looked at the, the, my, my superior, my captain, asked me about the grievance. Oh, did you say this? Or were you, were you mean or something? I was like, no. And I laughed at the, the grievance. I was like, <laughs> get out of here. But, you know, this is, this is the kind of, you know, um, new normal that's there, you know. But, but the million dollar question, though, is that if there are channels that you're not supposed to be able to watch, right. why are they available oh, on the TV? That's not a million dollar question. That's a silly dollar question. Yeah. yeah exactly. So you love making those channels available and then you're going to... You know, but then they're them. reprimanded for watching them. And that's the silly thing. Like that, that, that's, no, no, no. That's, that makes zero sense. No, right. That's like giving access to right. porn. Right. And you're not supposed to watch porn. Exactly. But you have access to porn. You think people aren't going to click on the porn? What, right. the, what the fuck is that? We have that more, makes zero sense. Exactly. We have more important things to do than, and than regulating the then TV. Then regulate the TV. We have to so make just sure, let right. them have the channels then. That doesn't make any... Do well, Okay, let, let me go back. Do some inmates have... Or some inmates like, oh, they can watch MTV and some can't? Or is it like none of them are supposed to watch it? All right. Well, this is, I mean, this is where you get into gray areas, okay? So they have workers on a unit. Now, workers have more, you know, leeway. More, because, more freedoms. Right, because, you know, when it's locked down, they lock in. Well, how I do it, I have them lock in. So explain what workers are. Because a lot of people don't know this job, right. man. So what are right. workers? Excuse me. So, all right, workers are inmate workers. So you have a, you have a block or, or a unit which consists of maybe... 70, 80, 90, 100 plus inmates. Now, the workers would be like a few cells, a few jail cells within that unit, and they would be able to, they would clean the unit. Um, so, um, the, say how do they earn that? How do they earn to be a worker? Good behavior. Um, you know, they ask um, officers, and officers talk amongst themselves, and then they say, okay, yeah, we'll give this guy the job. You know? And is that a privilege to be a worker? It's a great privilege to be a worker. Okay. Okay. So it's a privilege to be able to be the cleaner because you're getting more freedom outside right. your cell per se. So say like say lockdown for example say lockdown is 10 p.m. Okay. They're able to be they're able to you know we we have to get a count first you know again these are the gray areas that all the nicer officers would do I'm. I'm I'm sorry, I just didn't want to get in trouble and mess up counts. Right. So I make sure they at least go by the door, but, you know, lock in. I get the count and then let them out and do what they want to do. And then once they do their cleaning duties for like 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes, then they're able to hang out and watch these shows that you're talking about. So they can stay out later because exactly. it's trusted that they've done good behavior. And so then at that point, there may be like... Two or three officers on at that point, ten thirty at night. Two officers there, but we're like in the office. Two officers there because in the no office. one else is there. They ju they're there outside by themselves, and they're able to just watch your shows. And we're whatever. trusting that they're going to be out and just be able to do whatever. Oh yes, and they're yes, okay. they're fine. Yes, and how and there'll be like two or three of them. Well, I mean, a big unit there about a big unit would be maybe like six, seven, eight. All right, so six, seven, eight. Right. But these are six, seven, eight people that have been vetted. That no one's worried about. That these guys are like, hey man, we got this extra privilege. Everybody else is locked down. Yeah, and don't get me wrong. There's been cleaners that been that that has done that have been shady. That have been shady. Okay, okay, okay. I've had to fire a couple. Yeah. And 
you know, have to explain that. I'm just curious, like, yeah. you know, because we don't know, we don't see this shit. Right. So yeah. you're inside and you're looking at it. Right. So, but I mean, like, because if I was a cleaner and I like, you know, and I was cool with somebody right. down in the cell, I'd be down chilling at their cell, talking and laughing you could with do them. That. Can yeah. you do that? Yeah, you could do that. So you can be outside the cell, like, yo, what up? Yeah. Have you found people that are cleaners that, like, are bringing, um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, contraband. contraband? Like bringing contraband, meaning like drinks and like um, no, how about ramen contraband? noodles and contraband? No, that's not oh. If it's from the street, it's contraband. If it's from your cell, because you can get it from commissary. Yeah, you can order it yourself. Oh, so you can give people your commissary? No, oh, yeah, no problem. Can. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. but you're not supposed to see. That's a gray area again. You're not supposed to give pe- give things of value. See, these are all the things when you don't have. Because I used to keep the the code of a. Uh, uh, code of offenses in my pocket. Yeah. Because things get blurred so easily. Yeah. Right? And once you move that, I call it the, if you have a goal post, you stick the goal post in, right? That's you. And then you put an elastic band on that goal post, you yeah. stretch it out a little bit, that's your gray area. Yeah. Okay, sometimes it stretches a little bit, sometimes it stretches a lot. Yeah. But you never want to move that goal post because therefore you're going to stretch that rubber band until you're getting yourself in trouble. Right. Okay? Right, right, So you right. really got to keep your wits about you and, and, and know the rules, you know? So, but even if you know the rules, you can still get in trouble. Were you ever approached as a correctional officer to bring in something? Uh, did anybody ever ask you or um, assume that you would bring something in for them? Hmm. <laughs> Okay, so it doesn't work like that. Okay. Okay. First, because on TV, this is how we think it works. When we course. watch it on TV, we watch right. it on movies. It looks like it's like, yeah. oh, we got Officer Graham to bring in some shit. Right, right, right. You know what I mean? Right. We know we, and then they, then they're like, he's the weak link, and then we'll right. get him to bring in shit for us in his butthole all the time. Right, right, right. <laughs> right? That'll be uh, sort of contrary to what they thought. But, uh, <laughs> maybe uh, wishful we'll thinking a little bit, no. <laughs> Um, you know, it's not orange and new black. No, not, no, no, like that. Um, so it doesn't work like that. How it works is, um, uh, you know, everything is presentation, you know. So when you go in there and every day I'm, I'm, uh, before I, I go into that building, I'm in the parking lot and I'm, I have the lint roller bl- brush or lint roller. Yep. The, the pants are all, you know, lint free, the shirt, I'm putting on the shirt, et cetera, et cetera. Nice and pressed, everything. You go in there, um, you look the part. They're gonna know, you know. They sort of, they sort of have a, they sort of have an idea. Okay, well, mm, Mr. Grant looks like he takes his job a little bit too serious. You know, everything's all pressed. It's not gonna, you know. I don't know, right? <laughs> I don't like fuck with him, right? right. Yeah. So they may still, they're still, of course, they're gonna still try because what do you have in jail? Nothing yeah. but time. Yeah. Right. Just like uh, who said that? That was a. Uh, Master P in uh, Gone in 60 Seconds. I got nothing but time, baby. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, they're going to try different ways to get at you. Now, let's go with, um, j- um, just like the post what I was talking about earlier, they're not going to start with, can you bring us some, <laughs> some drugs in? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. Like, like, yo, can I get a little bit of extra Twinkies? Exactly. Can I get some, yo, can I get some, just, like, right. can I get a little bit extra? It's going to start with, can I get a, it's going to start with, <laughs> can I get a, a paper towel. <laughs> Can I get a paper towel? Like you know, they're not allowed a paper towel. Right. And again, and uh, l- 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 let's not you know um, take this the wrong way. Of course, we can feel bad and empathize, and yes, you know, people are human as well. Yeah, of course. When you create one standard for one inmate out of 70 or 80 people that are not used to doing the right thing, you will create sort of a chaos for yourself. So to make it nice and stupid, simple, um, you want to be the, the same with everybody. Yeah. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean you have to be mean, because you can right. reach out a conversation, we can, you know, uh, joke around and everything, but... You just want to make sure that you're, um, you, you, you're, you're not give, you're not being favorable to someone else. Yep. So anyway, so it starts like this. So hey, let me get a paper towel, please. No, sorry. Can I get a a, a piece of paper out of the printer, the printer that we use? Mm-hmm. You, no, sorry. Um, can I get an extra this? When, on your break, can you go and get me this? You mean on my break? Mm-hmm. You know so. It starts with that. Now, the person that lets them, you know, get... Because there are some that will do that. Exactly. Yeah. So, the person that, like... So, when you, you're you able to give them that extra piece of paper towel, then an extra piece of this, and then an extra piece of that, 
And then they're just going to start going more and going more and going more until you, that, that's how it starts. That's how you get into the, the drugs yeah. at the end. But when you, when you don't, um, when you just, you when know, you don't bite initially, right. You just leave it alone. So, so let me say this. So when I got out of school, I, you know, I was, a, I worked in a lockup mm -hmm. for violent offenders, 14 to 20. Mm, that's even tough too. Right? So they stayed in there until they were 20 because it was violent, right? You know, you mm -hmm. typically, you know, you get, when you're in a juvenile lockup, they get out at 18. But when mm -hmm. it's violent, they'll stay till 20. Mm -hmm. um, you know, getting out before the 21. You know, they stay right before they turn 21. Right. Um, what I, what the, the most aggravating, what made me get out of it and was the most aggravating thing to me. How long did you stay? I stayed like a year and a half. Okay. Couldn't do it. Right. Hey. The most aggravating thing to me was um, I would be trying to go by these rules yeah. that were in place, yeah. but there would be other people around me that wouldn't necessarily go by the rules. Now, that's fine, but what it would cause is like, I'm a dickhead now. Animosity, you're the, tall, you're the hard charger. I'm the hard, yeah, I'm the guy who's a, who's a hard ass. And everybody else is just not giving a fuck and letting stuff be. And then when people, because what you find is that when everybody, it's almost like being with a, it's almost like being with a woman as a dude. Like when everything is good, everything's good. And you're like, yo, man, she does whatever I say. And we talk and, and we, she always will do everything for me and we do everything for each other. And right, right. But, but once you fall out with each other, mm -hmm. once shit's not sweet anymore, right. once you guys don't love each other anymore, mm -hmm. once one of you has decided to move on, mm -hmm. all of a sudden you get to see how that person treats somebody that they don't really like. Right. And so that's how I feel it was with, those, with, with the people that were locked down. I felt like everybody's cool, everybody's happy when you, they get in what they want and everybody's cool and everything's good. But let some shit go wrong. And then there's a highlight on all the things that you did wrong for them. Well, like, oh, you, you yeah. let me stay. You know, all of a sudden they'll tell on you. Because at first they were your boy. And right. then they'll be like, right. yo, you let me stay out my cell right. extra time the other day. Or right. Corey let me stay out my cell the other time the, right. the other day. And it's like, God damn, why, why, how did you just flip on me like that? You know, like, and, and so, and so that's what I would see them do with these other people that would let things happen. So I never did that. I was kind of more like what you're saying. I right. was very, I was a little bit more by the book, like, yo man, you know, and they, and they, shit in a certain, in a, in a certain situation, in most situations, they respect that because they know what they're going to get. Right. You know, you're going to get some consistent, like no's from me. Like, we, I don't do that. You better ask ask the weak link. But the only thing I hate about it is with the weak link lets you have a phone call longer. Like, you know what I mean? I used to have to monitor the phone. Somebody could get on the phone and make a call. But you get, I, you know, some people would be like, man, I ain't worried about who they call. Go ahead, dial your own number. Mm -hmm. But we used to have to dial the number for them. Oh, but right. then there would be a lot of people who would be like, they dial their own number. Mm -hmm. This is just what this particular lockup was. And then they dial their own number. And I'm like, damn, you let this dude do whatever. So now they're looking at me like, Damn, dog, why you why you such a hard ass, yo? Why are you trying to dial my numbers? I'm like, because that's what I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But then other people are letting them do whatever else they want to do to dial whoever they're going to dial. And it just always caused too much. It, it made me always feel like I had an extra target on I me. I hear you. And, and I, 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 believe me, you can, go, you can go to where I worked and ask who was the, the hard charger of that jail. That's the, that's the, that's that's the, the lingo for it, hard charger? Hard charger, yes. That was me. That's, and, the, that's the dickhead. That's the that's the dude who. That was the guy that took it too serious. That's the guy. Yeah. And you know, it, it's unfortunate. Hard it's unfortunate because you know, sure, fine. I cared about the job, and you know what people didn't understand was, I actually cared about you more than the person that let you do everything you wanted to do. You know why? Because you can do whatever thing, anything you can want, anything you want to do. Then you're gonna go back when you get released, do anything you want to do, and then wind. Right back there. Mm -hmm. So I give you some structure before you uh, before you go back out. Okay, I remember one one thing I always uh, remember. One inmate, you know, left. He went on the street. Then he came back in, and I was like, "Hey, uh, what happened? You, you missed me?" And he was like, "No, you were the only reason why I didn't want to come back. You know, it's because you know, I made him, I told the line with him. You know, made sure he did what he was supposed to be doing." I thought that was a compliment. I, I took it as a compliment. Um, 
And consistency, what you said. Yes. That's the, they may not like you, they may like you or not like you, but they're going to respect you if you have, if you're consistent. And that's one thing I always try to bring to, to, the, to my job, consistency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at 7 a.m., I'm checking all, making sure there's no clotheslines up and all this stuff. Clotheslines, you know, they, what, these clotheslines, they, they make uh, clotheslines with string or with rope, self-made ropes, all this stuff. And they're not allowed to have this. And if it's not allowed, it's not going to be on my shift. Right, and the reason is we all know about Aaron Hernandez. Right. You know, there's there's a reason for this. People don't know about Aaron Hernandez. Aaron right. Hernandez was a tight end for the Patriots. Right, he got convicted of murder. He went away to prison, and he ended up hanging himself in his cell. Right, yeah, go ahead. So therefore, you know, you you, you don't want to be the person to have to write all those reports. Um, and forget about all the reports, but you don't want to have to go and have to save a life when you when you, if you did your job right. Prevent you could have prevented it. You know, you don't want yeah. any tragedies like that. Yeah. On your own heart, you know. Um, so, I just wanted to make sure. You know, I I always tell people I slept well at night, and it's not because I was sleeping in a bed. It's because I never did anything malicious to an inmate, or I never did anything that was uh, because they were an inmate. <laughs> do you, you know what I mean? Do you feel now? Being honest, you're out of the situation now. Yeah. And being 100% honest, did you used to go into work every day with, uh, were you ever, were you ever fearful going into your job being like, oh, I gotta do this again? Was there an extra level of angst and anxiety because you were going into a prison to work and when you realize that, when you really think about it, let's say you come home and you think about it and you're like, man, if somebody wanted to fuck me up, at periods of time when everybody is out. I have to answer that right now. All right. Go ahead. I'm just saying, when everybody is out, Go ahead. everybody's out and there's multiple people that could be out and there mm -hmm. could be 60 people out and mm -hmm. there's me and four other people out that are supposed to be in charge of these people, right? Mm -hmm. um, that really the numbers are on their side and mm -hmm. if somebody wanted to do something, I'm in a fucked up situation. Mm -hmm. Did it ever make you fearful about coming back home to your house? Um, I don't know. It's, there's there's no easy uh, answer for that without trying to sound like a tough guy. Whatever, Did you right? feel angsty? Did you ever feel anxious? Did okay. you feel this, like this, this is uncomfortable? One, all right, this is one thing. Yeah. I felt uncomfortable going to work every day and scared about getting fired every day. Because yeah. if an inmate does something, then they're going to look at me another way you know what you know the administration etc yeah and i'm like oh i don't I have to explain this this but, but I'm, we're in a jail i'm doing what i'm supposed to do and this is why i want that body cam this is why i would love i, I always used to say please put the ray lewis uh mic me up uh, the linebacker mic or whatever oh, the you know what mic. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 the please mic. please yeah. do it you have cameras up there but you don't know what's being said um now uh funny enough i uh, you asked you know, if the numbers are on this side, sure. You know, but we, you know, we, we, we call a call with our radars, uh, radars, but with our radios, we, we can call it in, call for backup. And they come fairly fast, right? It's only two two officers per, like, 80 you, 80. This is what I'm trying to say. Right. So if some shit was going to go down, I remember I remember doing, a, I remember going on a tour for school. Right. And, um, you know, like I said, I was a criminal justice major. And I remember going, one of my professors was an officer. And I remember we went to one of the prisons. Right. And I remember they were giving us a tour, and there's all these people out on the yard and shit, and I'm like, yo, <laughs> I'm like, if shit goes down, there's like five officers here right, right now with this, with all of us. If shit goes down, there's nothing they can do in that period of time to quell this shit, because it's like, if it was like a swarm, if it, it could be like a swarm, you're in gold. Yeah, but you gotta understand, I mean, listen, I, whether, if, listen, if they're just someone that just, you know, messed up with, you know, whatever, they had a bad day, they had a DUI, you know, we've had doctors in there, we've had teachers in there, professors mm -hmm. in there that have had a, a bad day. Yes, murderers in there, et cetera, et cetera. Even, even the murderers are, you know, worse than that. They, they still... That's why you can't judge them based on what they did when you're an officer. Mm -hmm. You judge them based on what you know how they are in there. And they, they, a lot of them are just, they just doing their time, um, do minding the business, um, 
trying to play whatever game they're trying to play to get an extra oodles and noodles or whatever from the next guy, you know. You know, it's just... So, it's not really that bad of an environment. Um, but, again, you know, when you are someone that toes the line, you have to go into cells and you're not supposed to have water bags. Okay, you know, you got to get that out of here. And you're the, oh, what are you, Officer Graham, of course, whatever. You, you do it, but you also, it's something called um, reactionary gap. You don't ever, you know, even though we're talking right here and you're mm-hmm. about, what, two feet away from me, three right. feet, you make sure you're a good three, three and a half, four feet because a reactionary gap is to make sure if they ever try to do anything, you can, you have enough space to react to it. Right. So there was never a time that I was, my back wasn't against the wall in the cell. Yeah. I, did, I knew where I was. You know, you always make sure you're aware of your surroundings. Right. Okay. So that, that's, that's just one, um one uh, way of uh, of offsetting the numbers. So they, if, if, even if they tried to do something, it was, you know, someone would call the, the partner knows where I am, you know, because they could see everywhere. And you have to fight off till you call that, that code. It was a code, you know, uh, right. whatever the code was. You know, you never know. I don't want to say anything no, no, outside. No, right, right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, right, whatever right. the code was, you call it. And um, people are running when you call that. Yeah. Right? So you're fine and... You, you, you gotta fight. If you have to go fight, you have to fight. I want another, another thing, sorry. Yep. Another thing is this. I always said my job was safer for me in the unit um, <laughs> than outside of the unit when I had to deal with paperwork or the bosses. Yeah. Okay? Because this is how it's safer. Um, again, I let people do what they want to do as long as it's within the confines of the rules because I don't want to get in trouble for anybody. Yeah. And they will get you, you know, you will get caught up with stuff and, and you don't want that. It's just, that's it. But some other inmates will be like, oh, well, you're not the cool one, so whatever. Hey, we're going to have to play that game. I'll do that dance then, you know? But I respect what they got to do and they have to respect what I got to do or we'll just have that issue. Anyway, so... If anything ever had to happen, and yes, inmate tried to attack me one time and and fight me and whatever, I run a unit to be safe for me. Mm-hmm. So they know if you know uh, if I try to attack Officer Graham, mm, yeah, he's he's gonna he's gonna fight back. Like you know, because they get one off on people, mm-hmm. they get that that one hit or quitter real quick, and then you know go down and all that stuff. But I'm not trying to. Get a get get a uh, get a punch mm-hmm. uh, to the face or whatever, and I have this for like three weeks, you know, or four weeks, five weeks. Mm-hmm. That's not fair, and then nothing, right? So I made sure that how I ran the units, you know, I I I I did the rules, but I made sure they understood, you know, listen, I'd rather you guys just enjoy, the, you know, you have the TV, you have the rec deck, you can play your games, your chess or whatever, your spades, and do all that stuff, watch the NFL games. But if you come this way and you want to, you know, be disrespectful or, or try to you know, um, get aggressive or whatever, yeah, then we're going to have to do that as well then. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But it wasn't safe for me because the grievances for me doing my job, it, you know, it, 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 it collected more and more stress on that area. Right, right, right. Then, then we got you. Right. But the people that were, that were appeasing the inmates were, you know, were okay with the administration, like, ooh, great, model citizen, but they were also getting punched in the face because they had to actually say no at one point. Yeah. You see what I mean? I got you, yeah. So, that's that's the difference. Right. I was good in there. It was like, <sighs> so when I come into the trap, is a funny thing, when I come into the trap. <laughs> and the trap is. It's, yeah, the trap is, um, there's one door to let you in from the hallway. Mm-hmm. That door has to close, mm-hmm. and then the other door lets you into the unit. Yep. That's operated by the people, the officers inside the unit. So right. when that closes, but when they saw me in that little trap, the <laughs> inmates or the workers or whatever, yeah. they're like, oh, officer. Here he comes. <laughs> uh, right? Yep, yep, yep. But they know what time it is. Yeah. And it, you can have a good time. Let, let me go back to something yeah. you said, which, which makes a lot of sense. Right. So from working in the lockup, right. which was funny, is that when you're talking about people being people, and I do agree, I just... I um. When you talk about people being people, it's like I learned how to play ping pong from the inmates. 
<laughs> and learn how to play chess. <laughs> That's the problem. From the inmates. I mean, I mean, I learned. We could have played ping great. pong, Corey. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> I I know, know, but I learned how to play great ping pong. Right. From from them, I learned how to play great chess from them. Like. Right. It was a cool, some of the coolest shit in the yeah, world. Yeah, you could watch that, some like, chess games and all that stuff. I didn't no, play. no, no, no. I didn't watch. I, no, no. I could play. Like oh. I would play with them. I was allowed to do that. Yeah, yeah. So I was allowed to do that. Nobody came for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was allowed to play. I was allowed to play. You know, I was allowed to play ping pong. I was allowed to play chess. I was allowed to do these things, and I learned a lot. Which I mean, is cool. Which and, is cool. It was so cool. Yeah. And I'm talking about. I had. There were people in there that had. Um, there were people in there that had. Uh, done very, 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 very violent things yeah. that had um, Clinton's giving me a drink right now and he's putting his fingers all over the fucking ice that I'm about to use. And, if you, guys, and if you guys know me, you know that shit is, is disgusting. Anyways, uh, so... so <laughs> Life of a correctional officer. <laughs> Dirty ass fucking jail fingers. Uh, so, so... Um, one, of the things that's, one of the things that was cool was that there were people... Uh, there were people that were locked down that had done very violent things. Right. Yeah. Which were some of the coolest people to sit exactly. and yeah. talk philosophy with. Right. And they've right. done violent things. Violent yeah, things. Cut right. people's throats yeah, and done yeah. other kinds of shit. And you're like, this is crazy. Right. And I'm sitting and talking to this, <clears throat> to this fucking dude. And um, it was like, it, it, I don't know. I, mean, I, I, don't, I, I, I just remember, I remember one situation. It was a dude who had cut somebody's throat. It's a white dude. <laughs> it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, other uh, black people that were locked up, and it was a bunch of white. It was white and black because you know it's younger. It's like it's like a, it's like a decent mix, but still, there was more black in this particular area. And I remember they'd be like, "Nah, we don't fuck with him. That motherfucker's crazy." Like nobody would nobody would even nobody would even deal with this dude. Right, right, right. right? right. But I could sit. They just be like, no one would like no one would even like deal with him like that. They were just like, he's crazy. And uh, but that dude could play. He was so good at chess, and he taught me so many. Good, like I would just sit and play chess with him, and like in my brain, in my brain at the time, like my guard never completely came all the way down. Obviously, but I would always be thinking like, man, this dude's kind of cool. But then I would be thinking like, I still can't relax. And so it was no, you like can't. you never, no, you never can you relax. Never and can. so and so. The, the the premise or the basis of my question before when I was asking you, do you ever feel angsty or uncomfortable? It's because, just like you said, you have your back against the wall. It's part of the reason why I got out of it. Like, I used to be a bouncer, you know what I mean? Like, after, you know, working in the lockups and before the lockups, I was bouncing in all these different clubs. And at a certain point, I was like, I don't want to bounce anymore. I don't want to be... I don't want to be the one that's responsible for running in and putting out the fire. I would rather run in and save the people after somebody put out the fire, but I don't want to be the one that has to be the, that is obligated to be the front line. I'm not saying I won't be because many times in my life, even to this day, I am that person, mm -hmm. but I don't want to have to be obligated to do it. And, and when you work in a lockup or if you're a police officer or you're a bouncer, <laughs> you're obligated to be the first line of person it who's like, hey, put that down. Stop doing that. Break that fight up. You got to go grab the person. You got to do and whatever. A, and it's a thankless job as well. I hate that. Yeah. I hate I that. Hear you. I but hate you know, that. it's... Just for me, it wasn't what I wanted to do anymore. Well, it, and, and I don't agree. scratch my cornea. And I agree. Don't fucking... Don't, 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 don't right. poke my eye, right. motherfucker. You know what I mean? I don't, agree. Don't, don't, don't loosen my tooth. Right, right. You know, right. from, from a scuffle that we're having. Right. You know, like, I'll do it if I have to, but I don't want to. Right. I'd rather pick and choose when I want to get in. But when it's your job, the picking and choosing is not there. It's like, this is what I'm here to do. You know, I don't know. <clears throat> it wasn't so bad. You know, the, the, this job, it, it, it's always going to be stressful. It's a stressful job. And it's also, you know, if you Google correct, the life of a correctional officer, it's a stressful job. Yeah. It's, it's not good mentally for people. Right. You know, so... You gotta really be uh, have an acquired taste to be able to do that. And a lot of people when they when they stay there, they have they're married, they have kids and all that stuff. So like you know what, salary and benefits. Let's just do it and go in. That's why they don't care so much, you know. But when you don't care so much, you put the stress on the next person. So say that you let some people out, like you know, um, the next shift is like say it's seven to three, then three to eleven. Say the seven to three shift, 
leaves the, the workers out or whatever. But the 3 to 11 shift guys, they like to do the counts with you know, everyone in. It doesn't matter who it is. Everyone mm-hmm. in, you know? So you, you sort of leave it up to the next shift. Like, hey, if you're cool, you're cool. If you're not, you're not. It's up to you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Instead of just saying, hey, you know, I, I'm, I'm making sure my unit is, my, my shift was all set if this person wants to let, let you out for their shift. You know, it's just stuff like that. So it, it, it's, it's a stressful job. And you have to make sure that you, you're able to, um, if, if that's your personality type. I knew it was not congruent with my personality type. Mm-hmm. Believe me, I did the job and I was able to be militant. I, I used to always get the joke, you know, or, or the question, hey, is you, is you, were you in the military? I was mm-hmm. like, I, and I, I would never answer them, but, you know, if a, if a co-worker asked me, I was like, no, my father was just militant. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that was it, you right. know. Um, but I just did the job, did it the way, the best way I could do it, you know. And it was like, it wasn't for, it was for myself as well, but also, so the bosses are happy. They look good or whatever, but I don't so, know, it was weird. So Clinton and I wrestled together uh, in high school. I won. Um Clinton was a was a, a one sixty yeah. uh, wrestler back in the day. Beast, 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 beast. He was bigger than most of the one sixty that he was wrestling. Um, uh, dominated. I mean, he was just dominating almost everybody that he wrestled. There would be uh, there would be there was a, a a couple of matches that I can remember where it would be like a long, lanky, very strong type of person that would give him uh, some difficulty. Uh, everybody else would be slammed and uh, pinned pretty quickly. Uh, but um, do you think that um, wrestling has given you life confidence in general? Just because, and I asked that question because uh, you realize that by us wrestling in high school, which is something that I will say that I'm gonna get my kids into. Uh, mm-hmm. Everybody in my life, I, I mean, I, I mean, wrestling is unbelievable, mm-hmm. and um, because you're you're basically learning how to fight, trained fighting in high school, legal trained handling yourself, mm-hmm. uh, and 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 you're fighting. I mean, there's no other sport where you're learning how to high school wise legally fight right. for your high school. Besides wrestling, and that's what I think is awesome. Do you think that that gave you confidence throughout your life, doing uh, tackling certain endeavors? Because and 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 again, I say that because wrestling, you're on a team, but you're individually going out on a mat by yourself to fight somebody, and it takes a lot of courage to build that up before you walk out onto the mat. Do you think it's helped you in your life? Uh yes, because I mean, just with the job we were just talking about. 80% of those fights are the fights that happens, you know, even with inmates and, you know, uh, fighting each other. They wind up on the ground. Yeah. So, I was already... Which you're comfortable with. Exactly. You yes. You know, it was, it was just a, a funny thing. So, um, um, yeah, I would, I, I, I would never uh, get nervous about that. I was like, hey, yeah, we'll, we don't have to wrestle. That's fine. No problem, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, wrestling's a good it's a good foundation. It's a good, you know, understanding of your of your um of your balance, you know, how how you're able to move and it's a discipline as well. To um learning your breathing, learning your strength, knowing if you went all out right away, then you you burn out, your your forearms are gonna get shot. Forearms are the illest yeah, that's right. to my wrestlers out there when you're, right. you're wrestling and you're hand fighting you're right. and, and, and you're on you're behind somebody and there's somebody's in you know in front of you and you're trying to get control of them and your forearms feel like they're they're gonna explode because right. of the they're they're constantly peeling your hands off of their hands as you're trying to control them and you're constantly trying to squeeze down on their hands. And then just the way that your forms feel like they're going to explode when you go into the second period. Mm-hmm. And you have to continue. And you you must continue to do this. It was unbelievable. Right. Um, the, the strength, the tenacity, the wind that it takes, the, the preparation that it takes. There was an article that I tell people about all the time. It came out in the 90s and it was in Forbes magazine. The article states, uh, and I don't know if I even talked to you about this article, 
But the article was like, um, there were more CEOs. They, they polled a lot of the top CEOs in the country at that time. One of the main things they had in common was wrestling. They said that it, it's such an unbelievable asset tool for life to, to be able to have that tenacity to go forward. I'm sure it would be a lot different now because there's a lot more female CEOs. And I know we had some female wrestlers then, but I still don't think we have as many as men. But I still think that's a By the cool way, trick. Alan McGrail was a is a correctional officer with me. Alan McGrail was a correctional officer with you? She's and good, she good. was a wrestler. Yeah. And she was awesome. She yeah. was good. She yeah. was good. She was really good. I seen her beat many dudes. Yeah. I seen Alan McGrail beat many dudes. That was fun. Yeah, that was fun. That was awesome. Uh, yeah. Alan McGrail is a girl that we both uh Clinton and I both wrestled with. Um I just remember I just I, I loved it, man. I loved I loved that time of life. I love being able to push yourself to that limit. I remember I remember being wrestling at 215, I really only weighed, like, I could have wrestled 189, mm -hmm. but I could have wrestled 71, but then, then they bumped me up to 89, and mm -hmm. so then I was weighing around 185, which right. I could have wrestled 189, then they bumped me to 215, but then our 215, our heavyweight wasn't able to really wrestle heavyweight, because he was around 215, so then they bumped me to heavyweight, because of strength, so I'm wrestling heavyweights, I'm wrestling the biggest dudes out there, and I'm weighing two, three weight classes lower than them mm -hmm. in wrestling those guys. And I remember just the coach being like, you're a giant killer, you can do it. And I'm just looking like, look at this big fucking dude you want me to wrestle. That's mm -hmm. crazy. Mm -hmm. how, how, how am I supposed to do that? <laughs> you know, and then going out and wrestling some of these dudes and just being like, it, it's just unbelievable. It was just unbelievable um, what you are able to accomplish when you have somebody that pushes for you a little bit. You know? Yeah, you know, uh, just uh, what wrestling. Uh, all right, this is one part in football. I remember I was I was hurt in the game, and you know when you get these sprained little ankle, whatever. Yeah. I'm hopping like off the field, and I remember the coach saying, "No, no, no, go back in there. We need you in there." And I was like, "Oh, okay." So I'm hopping back on the field, but I worked through the injury, uh, not the injury, but the hurt part. You know, it was, it was yeah. a nice little sprained ankle, whatever. Yeah. But you, but when you you can push your body through certain situations. And as you were able to do with wrestling, you, you know, adversity comes in all shapes and sizes. And in your case, it was a lot of shapes and sizes. But did you... So I didn't... One thing, one thing that really pushes people in sports and in life is having support and having a really good support system and people that really... Are rooting for you and want you to do well. It's a really helpful factor that if you don't have it, you look at other people and you're like, man, that's fucking nice. Now, I'll be honest with you. I grew up with my grandparents. My grandparents have never seen me wrestle. True. Like, they never saw me wrestle. They never saw me play football. They never saw any, none of that, none of that. I grew up with them. My grandfather's very hardcore, just like business is business. You know what I mean? I keep a roof over your head. I'm a working dude. I don't got time to take Saturdays off. That's a busy day at the barbershop. I don't have time to come watch you wrestle at night. I'm resting. You know what I mean? None of that. He's never seen a wrestling match. Never seen any sport that I've played ever. My mom, you know, God rest her soul, when she was alive, came to some baseball games when I played when I was in college. She came to a couple games. Um, but I never had that support. And I would look at people around me that would have that support. I, I can't remember you having that support. Hmm. Did you? I don't remember you Is having wrestling. Yeah. Oh, listen. Did you? Dad. Your dad came sometimes, right? I don't remember. Okay. I'm just saying. I don't remember yeah. you having that support. I don't want to make it all about me. I'm just saying. I didn't have it, but I yeah, can't personally no. remember. I feel like I remember your dad being there a few times in high school, coming to some matches. But it wasn't like because look, here's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. There were people on the team whose parents were there Every, that made yeah. shit. There were parents who made my fucking highlight tape. That's right. For wrestling. I have that Fucking too. Uh, uh, um, um, Ace. Uh, um, Ace um, yeah. Contact? Uh, Chris <laughs> Martin. Kid I went to school. Chris, kid, kid I went to, to school. It was my grade. Contact, yeah. Man. Chris Chris Martin. <laughs> Chris Martin, his dad, yeah. made my highlight tape for wrestling. Yeah. And I was like, yo, that's crazy. His dad made my tape. Yeah. Cause he filmed the matches when he came, and right. he made he fucking organized the tape. I had nobody else to do stuff like that for me, know. and I used to get so jealous of looking at other people's families who actually supported them and everything they were doing. They would show up at their shit. 
They'd want to be there. They'd want them to be there. They would. It was. It was. That's that's unbelievable when you have that. It is. It is. It's a hard. Like we can always be like, oh well, it gave me more of a fight to not have them there. It made no, me burn. No, it made me burn no. harder. No. All that shit is cool. But when you have somebody that's put, look, it's always easier to have somebody with their hands on their ass pushing you up than to have somebody holding onto your shoulders and pulling you down. Right. You know, and you're still fighting through it. Doesn't mean you can't fight through it and climb the wall. Right. But if you have somebody pushing you up on the wall, it's so much easier. Right. You know? Oh, when I mean, you max, when you mix that with talent. Yeah. Oh my it, God. You know, it's like love and a, and a flower and love and a child that blossoms, et cetera, et cetera, right? But, you know, it's it's tough to to say that um, or to see that also with, you know, all the to see that, yeah, To see that, yeah, but, with all the other families, right? You know, I mean... My mom worked. Yeah, I know you've seen the Living Color. Yeah, hey, like mom, the Headleys, right? Hey, hey, mom. Hey, mom got to go to work. <laughs> That's what it was. Yeah, you know, and yeah, so yeah. you grew up with that. You understood that. You know, um, yeah. she lived that lifestyle. That's what she was about. Um, could she have come to say? <laughs> I got a good joke for you. <laughs> but could she have come to some matches and some football games? Sure. Yeah. I mean, but she did her best for what she was. You know, and. And this is where we are now. We're not down south. Yeah. Down south is, you know, more they shut down stuff for yep. the games and all that. And up here, we have to work more for that. So, you know, the kids may not understand it, you know, what the light, you know, what we have to work for to, to live the lifestyle that we live, especially Boston, Milton, et cetera, right? Um, but, um, you know, in addition, yeah, father could have came around a little bit more. That would have been nice. You know, he came to a couple of football games, but whatever. You know, it's just, it is what it is, uh, and it's, uh, let's see, how about this? This is a good joke for you. So, which is actually something that really happened. So, Bay State Games, we, we had the picture of, right? Yeah, so Bay State Games is huge. Um, Bay State Games is uh, basically when you've done really well at, at whatever game you're playing, wrestling, mm -hmm. per se, when you've done really well, uh, you end up going to Bay State games. Okay? So, yeah, go ahead. So, uh, Bay State game is like a mini Summer Olympics type thing. Right? Yeah. For the, for the Bay State. For the Bay State. Yeah, right. exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It's Massachusetts. And it's a big deal. Is it really just in Massachusetts, right? Uh, yeah, pretty much. The Bay State. Yeah. So, I think we're the Bay State. We're the Bay State, the Bay State yeah. yeah. So, so, we're going there and we're wrestling, right? You and I. We're going, you know, yep. wrestling. Me and you, yeah, yeah. Right. Going, yeah. Different weight classes. Jeff Gardner. Right. Jeff. Another uh, teammate. Yep. So, um, <laughs> never forget, I'm wrestling and I'm doing a good job on this guy. Yeah. Right? So, doing, doing a decent yeah. job. And, um, you know, slamming here, slamming there, you yeah. know, all that stuff. <laughs> My mother told me this later on. She said, uh, or, or my brother probably told me, but she said, um, my mother said, oh my God, I can't watch, you know? And I'm, I'm doing a good job on this guy, yeah. right? You're like, he's he's going to feel it the next couple of days. Yeah. <laughs> and she was sitting next to the parent of that guy, oh <laughs> of, the, of the mother of that guy. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, well, how do you think I feel? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that could uh, that was funny. That was classic right there. That was my mother. So yeah. it doesn't matter that I was doing you know, well, doing well, or, yeah. or, or, or or you know physical. But the fact that I was physically doing something, you know, she was just concerned with, you know. Yeah. Like I'm running and you know running someone over for a touchdown. It was like, oh yeah. my god, you know, like just, that's a mom. But that's cool. But yeah. that still is cool because she's there and she still is, you right. know. Right. That that support is that that support right. is beast mode. I right. mean, it's just that it's just you know, it's just people don't take they, they can take that for granted that it means a lot to just have yeah. someone in your corner. Yeah. Because not having them there is, is very difficult. And I just I just I don't know, man. It was just a good. Those were good years of wrestling. And I just think that anybody who's listening to this, if you have the opportunity to get your children into wrestling. Uh, it's 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 an awesome way to stay conditioned, to stay um, to stay bullyproof. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you know, there's a lot because we had a lot of little. We had some nerdy dudes on the team that nobody was fucking with those dudes. Well, you know, I'm not gonna name no names, right. but nobody was fucking with right. those dudes. There was some dudes that was like 
this he's like super smart, a little nerdy, but nobody's fucking with him. Nobody. I mean, I'll say his name. I'll say one of the dudes was Sam Toma. Sam Toma. I don't want to call. Oh, him, yeah, I don't want to yeah, call yeah, him yeah. straight up nerdy. But no, he, was, he wasn't no. nerdy. Sam wasn't not, nerdy. Not, I mean, I understand what you're saying. It's not in a. a, a he negative, wasn't your typical way. like. He was not a jock. He's not like a. He's not. He's not walking around like a, you know. He's not like, walking around all cocky or whatever. He's the, he's the, a very with the with the, with the uh, Letterman's jacket. Yeah, he's not like that. He's a very he's a very chill, laid back dude, yeah, super yeah. smart. So such a such a sweet while. kid. Wow. Nice, nice, nice kid. Right. But you might think the fuck with him if you didn't know what he could do. Right, right, but Sam right. Sam whooped right, that ass. Right, right. <laughs> Sam, right. Sam can hold his own. You know, That's funny, Sam yeah. can hold his own, man. Which was awesome. I loved I love stuff like that. So That's funny. one one of the one of the um. The, the main reason we're doing this podcast, you know, we want to get a little background on Clinton. And uh, I just want you guys to know what our relationship was and, and why we were here um, and, and what brought us to be here right now. Um, Clinton recently um, went on this journey. And he, so, first of all, let me let me let me go backwards. He played football overseas, which we which we kind of brushed over. He played football overseas for a while. And that's going to be for another podcast. That's going to be for another sports podcast that we're going to get into, and we're going to talk a ton about that. But I just want you guys to know that this is who we're, who we're talking to right now. You know, he played football overseas, pro football overseas. He came back. He was a correctional officer. And then he was like, what the fuck am I going to do? Hmm. What do I want to do? So he decided. He first started with the business, a uh, sports business, uh, called Snits, which he initially... Uh, started doing. He was going hardcore with that. And what exactly was Snits? Snits was a social network predicated off of fitness. Mm -hmm. So this means that um, it's like the Facebook of fitness. I wanted a workout. I wanted. To, I did a survey. I got the um, based on that survey and what I wanted to do, what I had available to me as far as weights and gym equipment. I was able to get a workout sent to my email. Every day. Or the days that I wanted to work out. Yeah. And I'd bring that to the gym and do my workout. Yeah. That's what it was. And also, it was a social network so I could share that with my friends, share the progresses and all that. Mm hmm That's what it was. So, what what happened with Snits? Why did Snits not launch? Um, Snits launched. It just launched real soft. It was like a... Like if you know the the because and, I, and I'm asking him this and we haven't necessarily talked about this off air. Clinton put a lot of work, time, and effort into Snits. When he came back from overseas, this was the main focus. This is what he was working on. Mm -hmm. This is all his conversations were dominated by this. If you talk to him for longer than five minutes, he'd be like, "Yo, football's cool, but Snits is what's <laughs> happening right now. Snits is the way to go, right?" So this is who was dominating everything yes. right now, and so. And so, to see where people get knocked down and they continue to move forward is why I even bring this up, you know. And so, what if it was a soft launch? What exactly happened, and what did you learn from the breakdown of Snits? Snits, 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 Snits is a. You put a lot of money into it too. Oh, oh yes! Don't remind me, please. <laughs> yeah. You know, but with that money, it's it's an education. Um, you know, education in college, you pay for that. Education in business, education in failures, you also pay for, okay? Um, SNIT stood for, it was a, a nickname that I was given when I was younger, mm -hmm. but it uh, stood for Some Notice I Take Training Seriously, mm -hmm. okay? That was SNIT, SNITS.com. Um, so, what was the question? What did you learn from it not working? Well, what I learned was you needed to have the right team, Okay? I found out that the team, the people that, that were friends of mine, we had no type of business or product development experience. We never made a, a successful business. So that nobody that made a successful business was part of the team. Okay, so that was one. The second thing was I didn't have any mentors as well. Um, so, you know, you have to find out where there's mentors where you can get a mentor to help you with the process. And the most important part was I had to out due to lack of funding. You know, you have to make sure this. This is, I tell people what I spent for this. Snitz was like, oh, I don't know, fifty to sixty thousand dollars that I spent for this, right? When you're playing pro ball overseas, are you making money? I'm making money. 
Okay. So I'm, I. So this is a this. lot of your money all, going into this. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. So I, I, I take that money and I pump, I pump it in the snits. Now, I'm trying to, um, you know, uh, develop the, the, the website. And I'm, instead of having, you know, angel investors or investors to be able to... What kind of investors? Angel investors. What are angel investors? Angel investors is a little bit below VC. Venture capitalists, which actually take a part of your business. They, they help fund your business to make it grow into a bigger successful business. Vis-a-vis uh, Shark Tank, you know. Okay. But angel investors, the true term angel investors were people that actually came in at a very early eight, uh, early stage and, you know, gave you um, uh, some capital and probably took a little percentage, but they weren't really in for the money part. They were angels. Mm-hmm. You know, they wanted to see a successful business with a good business plan and, and um, uh, a timeline grow. But now it's gotten into the VC world, so it's sort of tough, you know. They, meaning that they, angel investors are, are are not really angels. It's like a diamond in a rough now. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. So and you didn't have angel didn't investors have that, for no. snits. Exactly. Gotcha. So I didn't have that. So I'm doing my own money, friends and family, et cetera, et cetera, money, which, you know, you tell some guy this now, they're like, oh, so you went into a gunfight with a knife. You know, it wasn't. You you were doing a fail. Already. So, in addition to that, not having the proper funding, I also was trying to outsource the work to do the, um, to do the, the web development. So Like on like Fiverr? Yes. Or like one of those like Fiverr, internet things right. that can help? Right. But, Fiverr's like uh, something you could go on and you're supposed to pay like five bucks. Five dollars, but, but they didn't. It wasn't five bucks. It was five, right? Yeah. And, but it's like a website called Fiverr, where like these people, all these people overseas, who will create things for you. I mean, you can go to it for many things now, um, to create stuff for you or right. to maintain, to do data entry things for you. Um, there's a there's a website called Fiverr. If you don't know about it, it's something you could check out. But yeah, go ahead. So, you know, long story short, I was um, outsourcing to another country. Because of the costs, and I realized I don't even know how to read code, so I can't I can't see if they're doing the right thing. What I wanted, all I thought was, this is what I'm gonna tell you, Corey. This is what I want the website to do. Can you please do it? Make it, you know. So, I just didn't have the right infrastructure. Mm-hmm. I didn't have the you know the marketing, the the person that understands this, uh, the coding aspect of it. And, you know, I got a very uh, good lesson with it. Mm-hmm. So now... And kids are learning how to do code now. Right. In, like, second, third grade, they're learning how to code. I still don't particularly know how to code myself. But, yeah, it's, we, um, it passed us, so... And I don't want... Anybody who's listening to this is like, what the hell are they talking about? Code, uh, just Google coding. Um, but it's coding, really it's like web development, it's source coding, it's... Uh, it's how they the, the fundamentals of building a website, making a website do what it does. Yeah. The function that it does, that's what you need to know. And I didn't know this, and I didn't speak that language. It's a language now. So MySpace actually used to teach you early coding. Really? Meaning like yeah, like um, um, you could go get MySpace templates, mm-hmm. and then what I would learn is like you could go in and choose to make your video autoplay or not autoplay. You can choose to remove your video. You could choose to take a widget, you know, which is something that would say, like, follow me on Instagram here. Right. You could go in and manipulate what that widget would say, like, you know, follow now right, on Instagram. Right, right, you could right, go in and change that. But these are all parts of coding that you learn early on. But more than that, I don't know. Hmm. I know how to work with N templates that I could go and mess with. Because mm-hmm. my brother know how to do, he had a book on HTML. Who, Tere? Tere, yeah. Tere can code like crazy. So, <laughs> yeah, so, to my, so my brother can code. All right, Clinton's leaving me for a second while he goes to pee. Uh, so he'll be back here shortly. And I, I, I refuse to take a break. But yeah, my brother, uh, my brother used to uh, code, which was, which was pretty helpful back in the day when, with, with MySpace. Um, when you could have four friends and then it changed to eight friends and then 16 friends and then shit started getting absurd. It would be like MySpace, let's <laughs> say it's 32. 
and you'd have 32 friends on MySpace, which was like, if you're going to put your whole friends list there, is anybody really special? Because then what started happening on MySpace, if you remember this, and I know some people listening don't even know what I'm talking about, but the ones that do, what started to happen on MySpace was people started to get a, you know, first you start with a top four, and it was a top eight, top 16, top 32. But then people, I really had people say to me before, Man, how come how come I'm not still in your top eight? Like I'd have like third, I'd have like sixteen pictures up, and they'd be like, "How come I'm number nine? Or how come I'm number 11? Which was hilarious to me because they were technically on my front page, but they weren't in a position that they wanted to be, and I thought that was really funny that people actually even cared about that, you know, and and how far along we've come where on Facebook there's no top things, which I think is pretty cool. Um, I was just talking to the people about top eight, top 16. Remember MySpace when you used oh, to have top eight? Oh, to man. Top <laughs> 16, top you 32. To... <laughs> people would be like, how come I'm not in your top four? Top, yes. How come I'm not in the first oh, four? And you'd be like, really? Is that how you're judging yourself? I'm telling you. you know? yeah, and I remember that. I, That's so funny. <laughs> right? I would go back and look at other people's pages after I moved them out of my top eight. And they would slowly move me out of their yeah, top eight and then move me to like nine or ten. I was like, oh, that's what I mean to you? That, that is so funny. funny. I remember that. Wow. And that, that's, that's that old school shit. So anyways, go ahead. Continue with, with, with Snitch. So you're saying you learned you didn't have the investors and you did, and, and basically you didn't have the angel investors. You realized you needed to have a good team. So ultimately, that business venture didn't work out. And no. you took an L. I took an L. Yes. Took an L. Took an L. Now, the fact that you started another one yeah. is awesome. The Thank fact you. that you started another one shows that you have some sort of, you have some sort of, I want to say cojones. Yeah. You have some sort of balls to get back into it, investing your own money. And this time you've decided to reach out to angel investors. Yeah. This time you decided to do a Kickstarter. Yeah. Now, um, the name of this business is called King Poppy. Um, before we dig into... No, 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 no. I, I actually want to talk about that. Where did you get the name King Poppy from and why King Poppy? All right. Well, let's see. Before you uh, create a name for any business, you're thinking of 100 names. And you're writing these names down on paper. You're making sure that, you know, it sounds fun, it sounds timeless. Is it abstract or is it descriptive? Okay, abstract is like Uber and descriptive is, is like uh, something that's descriptive, a word that is descriptive in describing what it is, okay? Uh, abstract is like Google. What's a Google? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So No, um, I can't, we can't find a descriptive word. You don't got anything you can think of in your brain? What, for Google? No, for descriptive. You said Google's oh. abstract. Why'd you just, don't just brush over fucking uh, descriptive. Okay. You were like, descriptive, descriptive. Abstract is Google. <laughs> <laughs> Google and Uber. <laughs> okay, all right. Call me out that yeah, one, right. all right. Yeah, yeah, um. yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, all right, no, that's cool. No, 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 no. Don't call me out and then leave it like it's cool. No, no, no. Descriptive is like, um, let's see. Um... Hmm. Not Arbella. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 <laughs> Not <right>. Geico. <laughs> um, Pizza Hut. Pizza Hut is pretty. Pizza, pizza Hut. Yeah, pretty you know, right? it's, yeah. It's Pizza a Hut. Hut. There's pizza in it, right? Not Papa Gino's. Not Papa Gino's. <laughs> Not Papa Gino's. We don't know what the fuck that does. Domino's. No. No. no Domino's. No. But P you get Pizza Hut pizza is, Hut. is Hut. Little, yes. little Caesars. No. Not no, so much. No. What is that? What's a little L Caesar? Caesar salad. We yeah. Little, little, yeah. Exactly. Get a large. All right. So um. Steakhouse. Steakhouse. Right. <laughs> right, right, steakhouse. Right, right. 99. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. nope. That's just, yep. But yeah. So, so yeah, so that's, so Pizza Hut will be the descriptive because we're talking about pizza. What's you in know, there. Hey, what's in there yep. or what it's about. Yep. But uh, Papa Gino's, we don't know who Papa Gino's is. Right. You know? So, um, so uh, how I thought of King Poppy, you know, I, I, I actually hired a guy to do the logo. Mm -hmm. Um good guy in the, in New York there and we was going back and forth you know trying to figure it out I mean <laughs> it's funny enough we you know 
um, let's see, uh, um, Canon Pop or mm-hmm. Pop This or you know we wanted to make it. We didn't. We weren't sure if it was descriptive or 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 abstract. So. Mm-hmm. You know, it pops. So what does it do? Oh, boom or what? Boom cap or something, you know, or, or, um, you know, uh, blow. I don't know. You know, we're yeah. just thinking, and all of a sudden, you know, I was thinking, okay, what about uh, pop cap? You know, and then I remember one of my friends said, oh, so you want to pop a cap in someone? You know, and I was like, yeah. oh, okay, oh, yeah, yeah, let's not that. go there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thanks for that. Um, yeah. You know, uh, let's turn the let's turn the page. Go to commercial. You know, so. Yeah. We did that, and then um, it was like, okay, poppy, fun, fun, poppy, poppy, the best, best, because this is the best. Mm-hmm. You're not going to find anything that does it better. Best, best, uh, top, pop, no, king, poppy. Mm-hmm. And we stuck with that. King poppy. And what does king poppy do? Because people right now are listening, and they don't fucking know. They're like, well, okay, what is this name talking about? What does king poppy do? What is king poppy? King poppy is a popping bottle opener. That ejects the bottle cap of a beer bottle, a glass beer bottle, or a glass soda bottle, in the air like a champagne cork. So if you imagine a champagne cork popping in the air, King Poppy, the popping bottle opener, pops that bottle cap in the air, just like a champagne cork. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the significance of that is? It turns any occasion into a celebration. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you get the pop sound like you get from a champagne bottle? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And I'll actually demonstrate that for you right now. Okay. You know they can't see us. So we're just going to hear it right now? Oh, you're going to hear it. And you're going to explain to them what I'm doing. You, know, you can see that I have the, <laughs> the bottle right All there. All right, so right now, he's grabbing, he just grabbed a beer bottle. What kind of beer is that? No, we don't. We have to make sure they pay for that. Oh, okay. We're going to give them, yeah. them props? Yeah. Okay. So he's grabbing a beer bottle right now. He's grabbing the, the, the King Poppy. Yes. Uh, what do we call it? I don't want to call it utensil. The King Poppy. Popping bottle opener? The popping bottle. The King Poppy <laughs> popping bottle opener right now bottle is what is what Clinton just grabbed. The bottle popper. The bottle popper. Mm-hmm. Okay. The King Poppy bottle popper. Mm-hmm. And right now he just grabbed it. He's putting it over a beer uh, bottle right now. He's mm-hmm. putting it over the cap and... Okay. So now we just have one click off. Mm-hmm. And so what happens is that one just it just popped the top off right there softly. So it was a soft that was a soft opening. So he did one because you can do it multiple ways. Mm-hmm. So if you don't want it to pop into the air, right. you can slowly open it, right. which would just let it fall, which is an awesome feature. So mm-hmm. everything doesn't always pop all around. Right. So if you got a lot of people around, you just want to open it. It's a very easy way to open a bottle cap. What I, what I like about it is like. Yeah, you have the manual ones that you can do, but this one's kind of a squeeze. It's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. There's tons of different types of uh, wine openers. There's manual ones, just like there's manual pop tops for uh, beers. You know, there's manual ones, you know, you just take it and you put it on there. And then there's other openers for wine bottles that make things much easier. It's a much more fun, party-driven gadget to use, and that's what King Poppy is. It's pretty cool. So... Now, when you open this one, if he opens this one a little bit more uh, aggressively, you hear the difference. You hear the difference with that one. So that one is a difference when he pops the top on that one. He can open it quickly or he can open it slowly and allow that to pop off. So that's what that's what I have noticed about it from, from fucking with it myself and playing around with it. I really like it. and It's pretty cool. So have you been getting a good response on um, showing people this? And the model has already obviously been set. The, the prototype is here. We, you know, they've been going, it's been going crazy online. I've been seeing it everywhere. How, how's the response been? The response has been, has been fun. You mm-hmm. know, it's been uh, interesting. Uh, you know, this is an exciting process for me and also terrifying at the same time because you're putting your heart and your soul into a product and you're hoping that people receive it. Yeah. Um, this is a product that is... A celebratory thing. You have games. You know. You have the bear pongs. You have the king poppy challenges. Now you know we're changing the whole dynamics of of drinking games and fun social gathering games, um, which you'll see on the uh, king poppy Instagram account. You, every Monday I put out new games, new new videos of people enjoying mm-hmm. uh, king poppy. Um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a it's been a, a wild ride. People, when they use it, 
and they they pop a bottle with it, they want to do it again. Right. You know, they, it's it, it's contagious. You know, people. Right. Oh, I want to try it. This is fun. Again, it's celebratory. So. So it's something that should be in most households, so that yeah. when people are, if, if because, um, it, here, here's the thing. Because I, I had I was asking you like, well, what, 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 what's, what's awesome about it? It's fucking opening beers. Right. It's opening bottles and it pops off and it mm-hmm. sounds like champagne. What's great about that? Mm-hmm. And as I started thinking about it over the last few days, I tell you what's great about it. It's great about it because maybe you don't want a fucking champagne. Right. Maybe it's a special mm-hmm. occasion. Right. Maybe somebody graduated. Maybe everybody's sitting around and they just want to open some beers and have a good time. Maybe fucking somebody gets headaches from champagne. Right, maybe right. that's what it is. It doesn't matter. But maybe the champagne is there as well. Maybe the, the pops pop off, uh, pop off of the champagne. But the, also the bottles are popping the whole time. We right. popping bottles. Literally, you're popping bottles. Everybody just heard how that shit pop right. and how fun that is. So that's part of the fun when you're popping a bottle of champagne. Right. It's like it's a special occasion. Oh, everybody goes crazy, right? right? Well, how fun is that to be able to do that all the time, at the whole time at an event, whatever occasion you're at, somebody's graduation. So I hope these things are going to be available for graduation and everything else, for the Super Bowl, and for when all these things are happening, all these special events that are going to be happening in people's lives and weddings and things. These, these are something that needs to be at a wedding. Like, it needs to be... It needs to be there. It needs to go around. It needs to be on the table. So when people are popping their shits at the tables, when the when the when the bartender is behind the bar at the tables, right. you know, and it's also very easy to use. Just right. like there's certain wine openers that are easy to use. Right. This is easy to use. So I, I'm I'm I think it's awesome, man. I think it's really, really, really gonna be something that takes off. Thank you. Thank and you. I think that it's something that should be in everybody's hands. Thank so you, you got to really uh, just figuring out how to make that happen is the next thing. How to figure it out, how to get more angel investors so you're not putting so much of your own right. and capital you know, behind that. Yeah, it's... it's it's Because you put a one, lot behind it already, Yes, right? but you know what? I also have a patent on it. Yeah. And that's something that is, is different than SNITs. I've learned from my, you know, my, my other uh, business. And, yeah. Um, and it, it helps me sharpen, you know, my game for this business. Right. Um... But yeah, I have a I have a patent on it right now, a continuation, two additional provisional patents as well. So we're really trying to make sure we protect this product mm-hmm. uh, because it does have a lot of potential, and we've seen that with the attention that it's received. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely weddings, graduations. Um, not everyone likes champagne. Not everybody wants to drink a whole champagne bottle. I don't know who drinks a whole champagne bottle by themselves, but why not just celebrate? You know, celebrate with a pop with just one beer. Right. Yeah. Or even a soda bottle. You know, there's glass soda bottles right. out there as well. Right, right. We do also have the patent for wine bottles and champagne bottles as well. But that's later on down, but it's in the patent. Right. Um, so, yeah, any occasion, we're talking about tailgates for right. uh, football games, for baseball games, for you know basketball games, whatever it is. Right. King Poppy turns your regular occasion into ce- celebration. Right. And what are we looking at for like an ejection rate? Because it seemed like from some of the videos I saw, it was pretty fun. People were actually popping the tops off and they were flying. Right. And people were trying to catch them in their cups and they right. were doing all this fun stuff with it. So what is, what, um, typically, if you're at a party and people are using this and they're popping it, is it then they pop it off, it goes across the room and people go pick that up? Or is it like, what, what's the what's the thing there? So if... So after they pop three of them, <clears throat> should they should they do the slow pop at that point if they don't want to go pick it up? Well, take the, a slow pop. It's, it's, it, yes, take a slow pop. There's also for the market version. There's a way to stop the pop so that it pops it doesn't pop in the air. It just catches it right there. Gotcha. So we have that feature, but this is the prototype. So we're just gonna. Could go to pop. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Good. Um, but I think it's cool to have the dual action. Yes. Where if you want it to pop and go crazy, it's gonna pop and go crazy, and then when you're ready for it not to. Just because it's an awesome opener. Right. It's a really easy opener. Right. You know what I mean? Just in general. Why not have a mechanism that allows you to turn it into an event right. and also just allows you to open your open, your open it. You just right. squeeze it and open the top so easily. Well, we made it we made it we're trying to focus on the easeability of it mm-hmm. for 
people that suffer from different ailments such as carpal tunnel syndrome mm-hmm. for older people um, and also repetitive stress injury for bartenders. Mm-hmm. If you ever go into a bar, you can may see some bartenders with a wrist brace on them. Yeah, um, carpal tunnel, yeah. Right. And also uh, older people, they're not able to do the twist-offs. Right. And yes, King Poppy works on twist-offs as well. Right. You know, so we're just trying to make, you know, we're not, we're trying to please everybody by not trying to please everybody, if that right. makes any sense. So, right. um, you know, we want people to be able to enjoy their life and, and, and not have to be um, limited because they can't open a beer bottle. Come on. You know, especially if you're that old, I, I think you deserve a beer, no? Right. <laughs> <laughs> How soon will people be able to get their hands on a King Poppy uh, on, on, on this? Because... I know I, I I have one, you know what I mean, and I use mine, but how soon will the general public be able to get their hands on one? Well, right now we're in negotiations with uh, manufacturers, and what we're trying to do is get a low number, because, listen, entrepreneurship, the barrier to entry is all about capital. Yeah. Okay? Marketing, if I had that... I'm loving it, McDonald's budget, yeah. then you know this is all over the place, right? Right, right. But we don't. So what do we do? We have to make sure we grassroots and we pound the pavements and make sure we get to where we need to be. Um, now, what we're trying to do now is, is get a thousand made. And when we sell those, because that's easily sold to liquor stores, which I've already contacted. Mm-hmm. Liquor stores, then one to one on tailgates, little. Party festivals as well, local festivals, mm-hmm. and um, tailgates for Red Sox, t- t- for Patriot, tailgates for Yankees, t- whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, but we're gonna deal locally now, and then sell those, and then get three thousand or four thousand. So we scale it up. So which we're working on that. Believe me, I'm, I'm working as as much as possible to to get that done. Um, of course, it's easier with a with an angel investor, right? But, um, it's it's a so are you currently accepting investors right now? Yes, I I I've had a couple of meetings already, and you know, sadly to say, some weren't a good fit. Um, you have to be real selective with the with this process as well. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, some were a good fit, but some things fall through. You know, with the business plan, we have to make sure that you know they're they're a good match for us. Yeah, you know, and, and it, it's a tough road, but it's. We're close. We're, yeah. we're one deal away because this is, it has a real estate for promotional products for, you know, again, your sports teams can be, their logos can be on there. Right. If, if you, if Which you, is cool. Yes. Once your logo's on there, yeah. once you get, you know, you get a patch one, you get a whatever one. I mean, that's awesome. Yeah. It, that's it, awesome. It, 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 there's a lot of possibilities with this, Corey. I mean, yeah. I call it brand relevance. If you want to go the, the beverage route. Whatever beverage companies you know out there, we all know the big ones, right? Yeah. And they all we, marketing is all about brand awareness, but if you're a big beverage company, people are aware of your brand, right? Right. But why do some beverage companies fall in the stocks or fall with the sales? Because the new millennials are right. are, are getting uh, are going to another product, right? Because they 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 identify more with that, right? So how about you you grab all you, you you pay the license King Poppy or you buy King Poppy for your beverage brand and you put your logo all over it and you put it with your with your product to all these new millennials, right? Yeah, I mean I think it's awesome mm-hmm. to come on uh, attached to uh, right. a case of beer. A case of beer. And then what is that? That's not <laughs> that's not even brand awareness anymore. Yeah. It's called brand relevance. Yeah. Because you're showing those new millennials, those new consumers that you know what? We're with the times. With we're we're old school. Yeah. For years, a uh, uh, beverage company, but we're coming with the times, and we're showing that we're about about the the fun part of life. Yeah. You know, so it just takes the right person with the right vision, with the right company, with the right vision to to make this really explode. Well, I'm excited, man. I can't wait to uh, I can't wait to see it all over the place, attached to the sides of. Uh, uh, 30 packs going out, see it inside a bar, seeing it at more people's houses, cookouts, parties, and it's just something that you see people use. You know what I mean? If it could slide into a couple films or into a couple of important <laughs> videos or something. So unfortunately, right at the very end of the podcast there, we got cut off. I don't know, something happened. Technically, I don't know what happened. Uh, <laughs> just my 
recording device acted a little weird there, so that it was annoying. But all I was saying at the end was we were just wrapping up, and I was saying I'd love to see his um, podcast. I'd love to see his product everywhere, um, and it was it was it was pretty cool, man. It was cool to sit down with a with a with a middle school friend that that is really doing it now. You know, from playing semi pro ball to going into um, starting his own businesses a couple times and creating his own products and everything and we're looking at it now from soup to nuts which is nuts it's crazy to me um so i'm excited for him for that so if you guys want to check into the product more you want to check into the development we'll definitely have clinton back you can check into that at kingpoppy.com uh, that's k-i-n-g-p-o-p-p-i.com that's where you can locate clinton you can also add him on instagram and check it out yourself so you can put a visual to it and that's my king poppy on instagram so it's M-Y, obviously, that's my, <laughs> King Poppy, K-I-N-G-P-O-P-P-I. For me, continue to like and subscribe to the podcast. I appreciate you guys. I really appreciate you spreading the podcast. The podcast has been growing and growing and growing, and I love that you guys are a part of it, listening to the different endeavors. Orlando will be back on the next podcast. Make sure you you check us out. Um, you can get me at Corey Rodriguez, Corey with an E, Rodriguez with an S. If you'd like to write into the podcast, it's Corey Rodriguez Comedy. Uh, Corey Rodriguez comedy at gmail.com. So make sure you guys write in there and uh, on my website, CoreyRodriguez.com. Corey with the E, Rodriguez with the S. You guys check me out there. Until then, until next time, I appreciate you guys listening. Peace out and enjoy your weekend.